We were standing beside a long railway convoy. We had been ordered to stack our guns on the tracks and take off our packs. The time was somewhere between twelve noon and one o'clock. Laos was munching on something he had taken from his pack. His face, although scarcely attractive, had grown familiar to us, even reassuring. As though his action were some kind of signal, we all took out our food, some immediately devouring the equivalent of two meals. Laos noticed this but contented himself with a brief comment. All right, go ahead, gobble it all down, but there won't be another distribution before the week is over. Although we all felt as if we'd eaten only half of what we really needed to assuage our giant appetites, we also felt a little bit warmer. By this time we had been waiting in the cold for more than two hours, and it was beginning to get the better of us. We tramped up and down, joking and stamping our feet. Some who had paper wrote letters, but my fingers were too numb, and I contented myself with observation. Trains loaded with war material were continuously passing through the station, which had turned into a vast bottleneck, with cars backed up for at least 600 yards. Everything seemed very badly organised, with convoys moving out, only to be shuttled onto other sections of track, where other companies brought from God knows where were being kept waiting as we were. People were always moving out of the way to let a train go by, only to see it a few minutes later, headed in the opposite direction. What a mess! The train we were leaning against seemed to have been immobilised for eternity. Perhaps it would have been bitter if it had never left. To give myself some exercise, I hoisted myself up as high as the air holes in the carriages. Instead of cattle, the train was filled with munitions. By this time we had been in the station for four hours and felt frozen. It grew colder as it grew dark, and to kill time we plunged once more into our provisions. Although it was already quite dark, traffic continued, dimly lit. Laos was beginning to look as though he had had enough. With his cap pulled down over his ears and his collar turned up, he was tramping up and down for warmth. He must have covered at least ten miles. We had formed a small group of friends from Chemnitz, which wasn't to break up until much later. Lenzen, Ollensheim and Hals, three Germans who spoke French as badly as I spoke German. Morvan, an Alsatian. Uterbeck, an Austrian, as dark and curly as an Italian dancer, who eventually dissociated himself from our group, and me, a Franco-German. Among the six of us, we were making progress in both languages, except for that damned Uterbeck, who never stopped humming Italian love songs under his breath. These plaintive melodies sounded out of place and totally foreign to ears more accustomed to Wagner than to Italian composers, especially those lamentations of an abandoned Neapolitan swain. Hals had a watch with a luminous dial, which informed us that it was already 8.30. We felt sure that our departure was imminent, that they were not going to leave us on the station platform for the night. But that is how it turned out. After another hour, Several men unpacked sleeping rolls and stretched out as best they could if possible on some raised surface for a little protection from the damp. Some even had the temerity to sleep under the train, hoping that it wouldn't start rolling. Our sergeant had settled on a pile of railway baggage and lit a cigarette. He looked worn out. We simply couldn't accept the idea of a night out of doors. It seemed impossible that we would be left where we were. We knew that the departure whistle would blow soon, and that all the idiots who hadn't had the patience to wait would have a fine time packing up their bedrolls in a hurry. As it turned out, we would have done better to imitate them and gain two hours sleep. Two hours later, we were still sitting on the cold stones of the roadbed. It was growing steadily colder, and a fine rain had begun to fall. Our sergeant was busy building himself a shelter with the railway baggage. Not at all a bad idea. When he covered this over with his waterproof sheet, he was completely sheltered. The old fox. We now felt compelled to find ourselves some shelter too. We couldn't move too far from our weapons, but we left them nonetheless, with their barrels in the air, open to the rain, expecting a royal dressing down later on. The best places, of course, were taken by this time, and the only thing we could think of was to shelter beneath the railway cars. It had certainly occurred to us to try to get inside, but the doors were held shut with wire cables. Full of complaints, we crawled into our disquieting and altogether relative shelter. The rain blew in sideways after us and we were furious. Later on, this anger made me laugh. 
As best we could, we arranged some degree of shelter from the rain. This was my first night in the open air, and needless to say I never shut my eyes for more than fifteen minutes at a time. I can remember long periods of staring at the huge axle that served as the roof of my bed. Through my exhaustion it often seemed to be shifting, as if the train were about to move. I would wake with a start to find that nothing had changed, fall back again into a half-sleep, only to be startled back into wakefulness once again. At the first glimmer of daylight we left this chance resting place, stiff and numb, looking like a gang of disinterred corpses. We fell in at eight o'clock and marched to the embarkation platform. Hals remarked several times that we could perfectly well have spent another night at the castle. None of us as yet had any idea of the dispiriting necessities of military life in wartime. This had been our first night out of doors, but we were destined to spend many others which were far worse. For the moment we were train guards. Our company had been divided among three long convoys of military material, two or three to a car. I found myself with Hals and Lenson on a flat car which carried airplane wings marked with a black cross and other parts covered by canvas. These were supplies destined for the Luftwaffe. According to the inscriptions we had been able to read, they came from Ratisbon and were going to Minsk. Minsk, Russia. Our mouths suddenly went dry. We were pursued by bad luck. We were stuck on an open car. The rain had turned to snow. The unbearable cold was intensified by the motion of the train. After due consideration, we ducked under the tarpaulin which covered a large Do 17 engine. This manoeuvre cut the wind, and by clinging together we managed to achieve a semblance of warmth. We stayed there a good hour, roaring with laughter over nothing. The train was rolling along and we hadn't the slightest idea what was happening outdoors. From time to time we could hear trains going in the other direction. All of a sudden, Lenson thought he heard a voice shouting above the noise of the wheels. Carefully, he stuck his head out of our shelter. It's Laos, he said calmly, turning back to us and pulling the canvas down again. Ten seconds later, the canvas was ripped back to reveal the sergeant fuming with rage at the sight of our three happy faces. Laos, wearing a helmet and gloves, looked very much on the job. His face and coat were powdered with snow, like the rest of the train, whose long profile joggled and swayed behind him. The air rang with a loud Achtung, but the spasmodic motion of the train prevented the order from being executed with its customary stiff precision. The scene which followed was worthy of burlesque. I can still see that great teddy bear hulls, swaying from right to left as he tried to maintain a rigid posture. As for me, my long coat had caught on one of the numerous sections of airplane engine, which made it impossible for me to straighten up. Laos was no better than we were at maintaining a dignified attitude. Finally, beside himself with exasperation, he braced himself with one knee against the floor. We followed his example, and from a certain distance we might have been taken for a quartet of conspirators whispering secrets. In fact, I and my companions were receiving a magisterial dressing down. What the hell do you think you're doing under there? Laos shouted. Where in God's name do you think you are, and what do you think you're supposed to be doing on this train? Hals, who had a spontaneous nature, interrupted our superior. He said that it was impossible to stay outside the canvas because the cold was so bad, and that anyway there was nothing to look at. It would seem that by making these observations, Hals was demonstrating a total lack of objectivity. Like an enraged gorilla, the sergeant seized our comrade by the collar and shook him violently, with a torrent of abuse. I'll make my report. At the first stop I'll have you sent to a disciplinary battalion. This is nothing less than abandoning your post. You could get the firing squad. What if a car had blown up behind you? You couldn't have warned anyone from that hole of yours. Why? Lenson asked. Is a car going to blow up? Shut up, idiot. There are terrorists all along the line, ready to risk anything. When they don't blow the trains right up, they throw explosives or incendiaries. You are here precisely to prevent that sort of thing. Take your helmets and come to the front of the car, or I'll throw the whole lot of you overboard. We didn't wait for him to repeat himself, and despite the cold which bit into our faces, we took up the positions he appointed. Laos continued forward through the loaded cars, hanging on as he moved from one to the next. He wasn't really a bully, 
but a man with a clear idea of a job to be done. I never saw him try to make things easier for himself, which is probably why I felt he must have a sympathetic streak, although I hadn't yet spoken to him. None of the other Feldwebels in the company were so strict. They claimed to be saving themselves for the big job, but when the moment came, Laus did as much as they, if not more. He was the oldest of the sergeants. Perhaps he had already been at the front. In fact, he was like every sergeant major in the world, afraid of responsibility and at the same time giving us a hard time. During his tirade, he had made us realise, rightly enough, that if we couldn't stand a little cold and a vague possible danger, we would never survive at the front. It certainly would be idiotic to get killed by some anarchist before we'd seen anything. We were rolling through a forest of squat, snow-covered pines. I had plenty of time to ponder the case of conscience the Feldwebel had put to me. The north of Poland seemed to be very sparsely populated. We had passed only a few small towns. Suddenly, well ahead of the train, I caught sight of a figure running along beside the tracks. I didn't think I could be the only person who'd noticed him, but apparently no one in any of the car's head was doing anything about him. Rapidly I manoeuvred my Mauser into a good position and took aim at what could only be a terrorist. Our train was moving very slowly, a perfect target for a bomb. In a few minutes I was level with the man. I couldn't see anything unusual about him. He was probably a Polish woodcutter who had come up out of curiosity. I felt disconcerted. I had been all ready to fire, and now nothing seemed to justify it. I aimed deliberately over his head and pulled the trigger. The report shook the air, and the butt of my gun crashed violently into my shoulder. The poor fellow took off as fast as he could, obviously fearing the worst, and I felt certain that my ill-considered action had made another enemy for the Reich. The train maintained its speed, and a few minutes later Laus appeared, continuing his endless patrol despite the cold. He gave me a curious look. We had decided to take duty in shifts. While two of us watched, the third would try to warm up under the canvas. We had now been on the train for something like eight hours, and felt apprehensive about the night, which would undoubtedly be spent in these conditions. Twenty minutes ago I had taken Halsey's place, and for twenty minutes had been unable to control my violent shivering. Night was drawing close, perhaps Minsk was too. The train was moving along the only track. To the north and to the south we were enclosed by dark forest. For the last quarter of an hour the train had been accelerating, which would undoubtedly result in our deaths by freezing. We had also consumed a large part of our rations to keep warm. Suddenly the train slowed down. The brake blocks grated against the wheels, and the couplings shook violently. We were soon moving at the speed of a bicycle. I saw the front of the train turn to the right. We were diverting onto a secondary track. The train moved forward for another five minutes, and then stopped. Two officers had jumped down from one of the front cars and were walking back. Laus and two other non-coms went out to meet them. They conferred for a moment but didn't tell us anything. All along the train people were looking out. The forest seemed a likely haven for terrorists. Our train had been standing still for several minutes when we heard the distant sound of wheels. We were walking up and down trying to warm ourselves up when a blast from a whistle accompanied by gestures indicated that we should return to our posts at once. A locomotive appeared in the distance on the track we had just left. It was entirely blacked out. What I saw next froze me with horror. I wish I were a writer of genius so that I could do justice to the vision which appeared before us. First we saw a car loaded with railway materials, pushed along in front of the locomotive and hiding its dim lights. Then came the smoking locomotive, its tender, and a closed car with a hole in its roof to accommodate a short length of smoking pipe, probably the train kitchen. Behind this, another car with high railings carried armed German soldiers. A twin-mounted machine gun covered the rest of the train, which consisted simply of open flat cars like ours, but loaded with a very different kind of freight. The first one of these to pass my uncomprehending eyes seemed to be carrying a confused heap of objects which only gradually became recognisable as human bodies. Directly behind this heap, other people were clinging together, crouching or standing. Each car was full to the bursting point. One of us, more informed than the others, told us in two words what we were looking at. 
Russian prisoners. I thought I had recognised the brown coats I had seen once before, near the castle, but it was really too dark to be sure. Hals looked at me. Except for the burning red spots made by the cold, his face was as white as a sheet. Did you see that? he whispered. They've piled up their dead to shield themselves from the wind. In my stupefaction I could only reply with something like a groan. Every car was carrying a shield of human bodies. I stood as if petrified by the horror of the sight rolling slowly by. Faces entirely drained of blood and bare feet stiffened by death and cold. The tenth car had just passed us when something even more horrible happened. Four or five bodies slid from the badly balanced load and fell to the side of the track. The funereal train didn't stop. A group of officers and non-coms from our train walked over to investigate. Driven by, I don't know what element of curiosity, I jumped down from our car and went over to the officers. I saluted and asked in a faltering voice if the men were dead. An officer looked at me in astonishment, and I realised that I had just abandoned my post. He must have noticed my confusion, as he didn't reprimand me. I think so, he said sadly. You can help your comrades bury them. Then he turned and walked away. Hals had come with me. We went back to our car to fetch shovels, and began to dig a trench a short distance above the embankment. Laos and another fellow looked through the dead men's clothes to try to find some identification. I learned later that most of these poor devils had no civilian identity. Hals and I needed all our nerve to drag two of them over to the ditch without looking at them. We were covering them with dirt when the departure whistle blew. It was growing colder by the minute. I felt overcome by a vast sense of disgust. An hour later, our train passed through a double hedge of structures, which, despite the absence of light, we could see were more or less destroyed. We passed another train, less sinister than the preceding one, but scarcely comforting. Its cars were marked with red crosses. Through some of the windows we could see stretchers, which must have been carrying badly wounded men. At other windows, soldiers swathed in bandages were waving to us. Finally, we arrived at Minsk station. Our train pulled to a stop down the whole length of a long, wide platform, covered with a busy, motley crowd. Armed soldiers and soldiers in fatigues, civilians, and groups of Russian prisoners cordoned in by other prisoners who wore red and white armbands and carried truncheons. These were the informers who had denounced the famous People's Commissars and were therefore anti-communist. They claimed the right of guarding their comrades, which suited our authorities very well as no one would be more likely to get a decent day's work from the Russian prisoners. We could hear orders being given, first in German, then in Russian. A crowd of men came up to our train, and the unloading began in the lights of the trucks parked along the platform. We joined in this work, which took the better part of two hours, warming ourselves a little, then plunging once more into our provisions. Hals, a greedy guts, had consumed more than half his allotment in less than two days. We spent the night in a large building where we were able to sleep in a certain degree of comfort. The next day we were sent to a military hospital, where we were kept for two days and given a series of shots. Minsk was very badly damaged. There were many gutted houses and walls cross-hatched by machine gun fire. Some of the streets were totally impassable, with a continuous line of shell holes and bomb craters, often more than 15 feet deep. Passageways of a sort had been made by planks and other solid objects thrown across this chaos. From time to time we gave way to a Russian woman loaded with provisions, and always followed by four or five children who stared at us with astonishingly round eyes. There were also many curious shops whose broken windows had been replaced by boards or sacks stuffed with straw. Hals, Lenson, Morvan and I went into several of these out of curiosity. There was always an array of big earthenware crocks painted in various colours, which contained either a liquid and steeping plants, dried vegetables, or a curious heavy syrup, which was halfway between jam and butter. As we didn't know how to say so much as hello in Russian, we always went into these places talking among ourselves. The few Russians who were inside invariably assumed an attitude half anxious, half smiling, while the shopkeeper or proprietress would approach us with a white-lipped smile and offer us large dippers of these products, 
in an obvious effort to placate the fierce warriors they imagined us to be. We were often given a fine yellowish flour to mix into this syrup, whose taste was far from disagreeable, somewhat reminiscent of honey. Its only discouraging aspect was a superabundance of fat. I can still see the faces of those Russians, smiling as they held out this product and pronouncing a word which sounded rather like ulka. I never was sure whether this meant eat or was simply the name of the mixture. There were days when we really gorged ourselves on ulka, which nonetheless did not prevent us from appearing at eleven o'clock for the official midday meal. Hals accepted everything the Russians offered him with so much politeness. Sometimes I found him quite revolting, holding out his mess tin for the largesse of these Soviet merchants as they poured into it, mixtures resembling each other only in their loose, runny consistency. Sometimes his tin would hold a combination of the famous olka, cooked wheat, salt herring cut into pieces, and several other ingredients. Whatever the concoction, Hals devoured it with evident relish, like a great pig. Except for these moments of distraction seized in the intervals between our many jobs, we scarcely had time to amuse ourselves. Minsk was an important army supply centre, where shipments were constantly loaded and unloaded. Life for the troops in this sector was remarkably well organised. Mail was distributed, there were films for soldiers on leave which we were not allowed to attend, Libraries and restaurants run by Russian civilians, but reserved entirely for German soldiers. The restaurants were all too expensive for me, and I never went into them. But Hals, who would sacrifice anything for a good stuffing, spent all his money in these places, and a certain amount of ours. The understanding was that he would give us a detailed account of his experiences, which he adhered to faithfully, with many embellishments. We slavered with vicarious pleasure as we listened to him. We were much better fed than we had been in Poland, and were able to supplement our rations very cheaply, which we really needed to do. The cold in these opening days of December had become extremely sharp, dropping to more than five degrees below zero. The snow, which fell in great abundance, never melted, and in places was already over three feet deep. Evidently this slowed the movement of supplies to the front, and, according to troops returning from forward positions where the cold was even more bitter than at Minsk, the poor fellows were reduced to sharing rations which were already ridiculously small. Insufficient food combined with the cold produced many cases of pneumonia, frostbite and frozen limbs. At this moment, the Reich was making an immense effort to protect its soldiers from the implacable hostility of the Russian winter. At Minsk, Kovno and Kiev, there were enormous stores of blankets, special winter clothing made of sheepskin, overshoes with thick insulating soles and uppers of matted hair, gloves, hoods of double catskin, and portable heaters which operated equally well on gasoline, oil or solidified alcohol, mountains of rations in specially conditioned boxes, and thousands of other necessities. It was our duty, as convoy troops of the Rollbahn, to deliver all of this to the front lines, where the combat troops were desperately awaiting us. We made superhuman efforts, and yet they were not enough. The punishment we suffered, not at the hands of the Russian army, which until that moment had done almost nothing except retreat, but from the cold, is almost beyond the powers of description. Outside the great towns there had not yet been time to repair the damaged roads, few and far between to begin with, or to open others. While our unit was doing its autumn gymnastics, the Wehrmacht, after an extraordinary advance, had marched itself and its supplies into an unbelievable quagmire. Then the first frosts had solidified the monstrous ruts leading to the east. Our machines had suffered enormously on these roads, which in fact were passable only for wagons, but the hardening of the soil had temporarily allowed the provisioning of the troops. Then winter poured down its tons of snow across the immensity of Russia, once again paralysing traffic. That is the point we had reached in December 1942. We shoveled away snow so that our trucks could move forward 15 or 20 miles in a morning, only to find our efforts covered over again the same day. The earth beneath the snow was a sinister relief of bumps and potholes, which we tamped down or blew up. In the evenings we scrambled to find shelter for the night. Sometimes this would be a butt fitted out by the engineers, sometimes an isper a log hut or any house we could find. 
We often crowded more than 50 men into a butt intended for a couple and two children. The most desired accommodations were the big tents especially designed for Russia. They were tall and pointed, like teepees, weatherproofed, and planned for nine men. We were rarely fewer than 20, and even at that there weren't enough tents. Luckily, we had raided our stores of food because of the cold, and with enough to eat, we were able to keep going reasonably well. Some of us began to crawl with vermin, as we were only rarely able to wash. And when we returned to Minsk, our first duty was to pass through disinfection. I was beginning to feel that I'd had more than enough of holy Russia and of truck driving. Like everybody else, I was afraid of the idea of being under fire. But I was also beginning to long to use the Mauser, which had been dragging around with me for what seemed like an eternity, without ever being the slightest use. I felt that somehow firing at something would avenge me for my sufferings from the cold and from my blisters. My hands were badly blistered from shoveling, and my woolen gloves were already full of holes, exposing the tops of my icy fingers. My hands and feet felt the cold so sharply that it sometimes seemed as if the pain were stabbing me in the heart. The thermometer remained around five degrees below zero. We were now billeted some 15 miles north of Minsk, guarding a huge parking depot for military vehicles. We occupied the seven or eight houses in the hamlet, leaving only one, the largest, occupied by a Russian family. Their name was Korsky. They had two daughters and claimed to have originally come from the Crimea, which they spoke of with nostalgia. They ran a kind of canteen where we could buy food and drink from our own pockets and find a few companions with whom to kill time. The snow had stopped, but the cold was growing steadily more intense. One evening, after our company had been in the hamlet for about a week, I was scheduled for two hours of guard duty. I crossed the huge parking lot where 500 or more vehicles of every description were half buried in snow. I had been feeling apprehensive all day at the prospect of walking across this space at night. It would be so easy for partisans to hide between the cars and shoot us as we went by. But I had gradually persuaded myself that the war, if it existed at all, was really taking place somewhere else. The only Russians I had seen were either merchants or prisoners, and it seemed highly probable that I would never see any others. With this idea in my head, I walked to my post, about 15 yards from the first vehicles, through a trench about a yard deep, which allowed us to advance as far as the cars, or withdraw, without being exposed. The edges of the trench had already been raised nearly another three feet by new snow, and each fresh fall obliged us to dig. I stood up on the box that allowed the sentry to see a little farther. I had wrapped a blanket over my coat, which made it very hard for me to move my arms. I had refused my allotment of alcohol, the taste of which disgusted me, and was mentally preparing myself for another siege of uncontrollable trembling from the cold. The night was clear. I could have seen a raven a hundred yards off. In the distance, the horizon was cut by a mass of stunted bushes. Three of the four telephone lines which crossed our camp were visible, stretching away in different directions. Their posts, shoved unevenly into the ground, were indifferent supports for the wire, which sometimes drooped right down to the snow. My nose, the only part of me directly exposed, began to burn with cold. I had pulled my cap down as far as I could, so that my forehead and part of my cheeks were covered. Over this, I wore the helmet required for guard duty. The turned-up collar of the pullover my parents had sent me overlapped the edge of my cap at the back of my head. From time to time I looked at the expanse of machinery I was guarding and wondered what we would do if we had to move it all in a hurry. The engines must have reached a state of magnificent solidity. I had been at my post for a good hour when suddenly a silhouette appeared at the edge of the parking lot. I threw myself down into the bottom of my hole. Before extracting my hands from the depths of my pockets, I risked another look over my parapet. The silhouette was advancing toward me. It must be one of our men making the rounds, but supposing it was a Bolshevik. Grunting with the effort, I pulled my hands from their shelter and grabbed my gun. The breech, sticky with frost, bit into my fingers as I manoeuvred my weapon into firing position and shouted out, Where da? I got back a reasonable reply, and my bullet remained in the gun. All the same, I had been prudent to take these elementary precautions. It was an officer going his rounds.
I saluted. Everything all right? Yes, Lieutenant. Fine. Well, happy Christmas. What? Is it Christmas? Yes, look over there. He pointed to the Korski's house. The roof, loaded with snow, sloped down to ground level. The narrow windows were shining far more brightly than blackout regulations usually permitted, and in their light I could see the swiftly moving silhouettes of my comrades. A few moments later a tall flame burst from an enormous woodpile which must have been soaked with gasoline. A song supported by three hundred voices ascended slowly into the stillness of the frozen night. O oh, Weihnacht! O oh, stille Nacht! Was it possible? At that moment, everything beyond the perimeter of the camp was without meaning for me. I couldn't tear my eyes from the light of the bonfire. The faces closest to the flames were illuminated. The rest were lost in darkness, while the strong outpouring of song continued, divided now into several parts. Perhaps the circumstances of this particular Christmas night made a critical difference, but in all the time since then, I haven't heard anything which moved me so much. The memories of my earliest youth, still so close, returned to me for the first time since I had been a soldier. What was happening at home this evening? What was happening in France? We had heard bulletins which informed us that many French troops were now fighting along with us, news which made me rejoice. The thought of Frenchmen and Germans marching side by side seemed marvellous to me. Soon we would no longer have to be cold, the war would be over and we could all recite our adventures at home. This Christmas hadn't brought me any gift I could hold in my hand, but had brought so much good news about the harmony between my two countries that I felt overwhelmed. Because I knew that I was now a man, I kept firmly at the back of my mind a foolish and embarrassing idea which kept pursuing me. I really would have liked someone to give me an ingenious mechanical toy. My companions were still singing, and all along the front millions like them must have been singing as they were. I didn't know that at that very hour, Soviet T-34 tanks, taking advantage of the truce which Christmas was supposed to bring, were crushing the forward posts of the 6th Army in the Armatovsk sector. I didn't know that my comrades in the 6th Army, in which one of my uncles was serving, were dying by the thousands in the hell of Stalingrad. I didn't know that German towns were being subjected to the horrifying bombardments of the RAF and the USAF, and I would never have dared to think that the French would refuse a Franco-German Entente. This was, in its way, the most beautiful Christmas I had ever seen, made entirely of disinterested emotion and stripped of all tawdry trimmings. I was all alone beneath an enormous starred sky, and I can remember a tear running down my frozen cheek a tear neither of pain nor of joy, but of emotion created by intense experience. By the time I got back to the billet, the officers had put an end to the celebrations and ordered the bonfire extinguished. Hals had saved a half bottle of schnapps for me. I swallowed down a few mouthfuls, not to disappoint him. Four more days went by. The hard cold continued, embellished by snow-filled squalls. We went out only for obligatory duties, which we reduced to the minimum, and burned tons of wood. The houses had been built to conserve heat, and we were sometimes even too hot. We felt very well, and as is usual under such circumstances, we very soon had some trouble. Ours began one morning, sometime around three o'clock. A guard noisily kicked open the door of the hut, admitting a blast of icy air and two soldiers whose stiff, bluish faces made them look remarkably alike. They rushed to our stove, and it was a few minutes before they spoke. Along with everybody else, I shouted at them to shut the door. In reply, we received a curse and were ordered to stand at attention. As we gaped, somewhat startled and without reaction, the fellow who had shouted kicked over the bench standing next to him, and shouting out his order a second time, hurled himself at the improvised bed of one of our men, violently ripping apart the mound of blankets, coats and jackets in which our comrade had buried himself. In the dim light of the stove, we recognised the epaulets of a Feldwebel. Are you bastards going to get the hell up? He shouted, pulling out everybody he could reach. Who's at the head of this bunch? It's a disgrace. Do you think this is how we'll stop the Russian offensive? If you're not ready in ten minutes, I'll throw you out of here just the way you are. Stupid with sleep and stunned by our sudden awakening, we hurriedly collected our things, leaving the door wide open 
the Feldwebel rushed from our butt like a madman to inject panic into the Isba across the way. We had no very clear idea of what was happening. Our sentry, who seemed quite shaken, told us that the intruders had arrived from Minsk in a sidecar. Those fifteen-odd miles must have taken them quite a long time, which would explain their furious condition. But despite all the demonic howling the Feldwebel could muster, it was a full twenty minutes before we were standing at attention in the snow. Laus, who had been as deeply asleep as anyone else, tried to shock us into wakefulness with a pretense of rage as intense as his colleagues. The other Feldwebel, whose anger had not abated, barked out our orders. You will join Commandant Ultrana's unit at Minsk before dawn. He turned to Laus. You will take fifteen trucks from the depot and proceed as I've ordered. Why hadn't he telephoned, instead of working himself into such a state? We found out later that while we had been sleeping peacefully, the telephone line had been cut in four places. The difficulty of getting underway and bringing the trucks out from the depot was almost unimaginable. We had to roll out barrels of gasoline and alcohol to fill the gas tanks and radiators, crank up the engines and exhausting labour and shovel out cubic yards of snow, almost entirely without light. When the fifteen trucks were ready, we set out for Minsk, following the bumpy, snow-covered track the Feldwebel had taken to reach us. One of the trucks skidded on the icy ground, and it took a good half hour to pull it from the ditch. We hooked it to another truck, which could only skate along the ice. In the end, almost the entire company was involved in the struggle, and we literally carried the damn machine back onto the road. Toward eight o'clock in the morning, well before the late winter dawn of those regions, we joined Ultrana and his regiment, and stood shivering, despite our exertions, in a vast city square, with two or three thousand other soldiers. Minsk seemed to be bursting with excitement and energy. A network of loudspeakers, which had been set up throughout the square, disseminated a short lecture from the High Command. The lecture pointed out that even a victorious army had to accept deaths and casualties and that our role as a convoy unit was to carry, at whatever the cost, and despite all the hardships which the High Command thoroughly recognised, the food, munitions and material the combat troops required. Our convoy, by any means available, had to reach the banks of the Volga, so that von Paulus could continue to wage his victorious battle. One thousand miles separated us from our destination, and we hadn't a moment to spare. We left after the midday meal. I found myself, separated from my closest friends, aboard a five-and-a-half-ton DKW loaded with heavy automatic weapons. The road leaving the city was well ploughed, and we rolled along at a brisk pace. There must have been road gangs working around the clock. The snow banks on either side of the road were nearly twelve feet high. We passed a signpost bristling with pointers. On the sign indicating the road we took, I read Nach Pripet, Kiev, Danieppa, Kharkov, Dnipropetrovsk. Our troops had rounded up everyone capable of holding a shovel, and we were able to cover nearly 100 miles in good time. We soon reached the summit of a hill, from which we could see the immensity of the Ukraine stretching into the distance under a yellowish-grey sky. The ten or twelve vehicles ahead of us had suffered a serious reduction in speed. Ahead of them, a company of soldiers were busily engaged in moving snow. A heavy truck was pushing a sled fitted with a kind of ventilator, which blew out the snow in all directions. Beyond lay an infinity of immaculate snow nearly three feet deep. Heavy snowfalls buried the road so completely after the passage of each convoy that we needed a compass to dig it out again. Our commanding officer and his non-coms had walked a short distance out onto the upswept snow, sinking in over the tops of their boots, and were scanning the horizon wondering how they could possibly proceed through all that soggy cotton. Inside our DKW, with all the windows shut, I and my travelling companion were relishing the warmth of our running engine, but soon they were ordering us out of our machines and distributing snow shovels. As there weren't enough to go round, our non-coms told us to use anything we could lay our hands on. I saw men digging with boards, helmets, big serving platters. With two other fellows, I was pushing against the tailgate of a truck which we had detached, hoping to use it as a crude sort of snowplough. The blast of a Feldwebel's whistle interrupted our disorganised labour. What do you think you're proving over there? Come along with me, we'll go and round up some manpower. Bring your guns. I felt a surge of jubilation, 
which I kept well hidden, as I inwardly thanked the idiots who had devised our hopeless procedure. I preferred almost anything to shoveling snow. We followed the Feldwebel. I had no idea where he hoped to find more manpower. We had only passed two deserted villages since leaving Minsk. With our guns slung, our little group split off from the track the trucks had traced in the snow and headed north. We sank in over our knees with every step, which made progress extremely difficult. For ten minutes I did my best to follow the Feldwebel, who was about fifteen feet ahead of me. I was gasping for breath, and I could feel the sweat beginning to trickle down my spine under the heavy cloth of my coat. My breath projected long streams of vapour, which vanished instantly in the icy air. I kept my eyes glued to the Feldwebel's deep footprints, trying to step exactly into them. But as he was bigger than I, this meant that every step was a leap. I deliberately avoided looking at the horizon, which seemed so far away. A thin screen of birches soon hid the convoy from us. Ludicrous in our smallness, we continued forward into the immensity of white. I was beginning to wonder where our non-com thought he would find his famous manpower. We had been exhausting ourselves in this way for nearly an hour. Suddenly, in the absolute quiet, we heard a rumbling sound which was growing steadily louder. We stopped. Our sergeant limited himself to the observation that we hadn't much further to go, and then added that it was a pity we would miss this one. I didn't really understand what he was talking about, but the noise was becoming increasingly clear. To our left I caught sight of a black line stretching across the snow. A train. We were approaching a railway line. I still didn't see what a train could do for us. Would they take our cargoes on board? The train was going by very slowly about 500 yards ahead of us. It was extremely long, a line of black broken at intervals by one of the five locomotives, spewing out impressive clouds of white vapour which vanished almost instantly, as if by magic. The train must have had a special mechanism for snow disposal. Fifteen minutes later, we reached the tracks. A lot of supply trains go through here, the Feldwebel said. Most of the cars carry material, but there are usually a few passenger cars for Russian civilians. We'll stop one of them and collect some Russian labour. Finally, I understood. All we had to do now was wait. We tramped briskly up and down the tracks, trying to keep warm. However, it felt as if the temperature had risen somewhat, as if by now it might be up to 15 degrees, which indicates the astonishing degree to which we had grown accustomed to zero temperatures. The cold, as we waited for the next train, seemed quite bearable. Soldiers wearing only pullovers were shoveling snow and streaming with sweat. I have never met anyone better able to stand punishment, whether from cold or heat or anything else, than the Germans. Each Russian I saw was more frozen than the last, but I certainly could not feel superior on that account. Life in Russia for me was a perpetual shivering fit. The first train passed by without even slowing down. Our Feldwebel, who had outdone himself in his efforts to stop it, was furious. Soldiers shouted to us from the train that their orders were not to stop for any reason whatever. Extremely irritated, we walked on in the direction of the train which had passed us. At all events, the road must be parallel to the tracks. We would only have to make a right-angle turn to find our company again. The difficulty was that we were far from the kitchen, and the hour for the distribution of food must have come and gone. I had two pieces of rye bread in my coat pocket, but I didn't want to take them out for fear of having to share them. The two soldiers with whom I had been shoveling snow must have known each other for some time. They were deep in conversation, and had stuck together ever since we'd left the convoy. Our non-com was walking ahead of us, by himself, and I tried to catch up with him. By now we had been walking for some time. The tracks were sunk between two banks which supported a thin growth of scrubby brush. They extended straight ahead into an indefinite distance. If a train came along, we would be able to see it for at least five miles. The scrub on the banks at this point was growing more thickly and extending a greater distance from the tracks. It was now some three hours since we had left our company. Everything stood out clearly against the snow. For some moments now, I had been staring at a black shape about 500 yards away. Ten minutes later, we could see that it was a hut. Our Feldwebel was walking toward it. It must be a shelter for railway workers. The Feldwebel raised his voice. Hurry up, 
We'll wait in that shelter over there. It didn't seem a bad idea. We had regrouped, and a young fellow covered with freckles, one of my snow-shoveling companions, was joking with his friend. We were making our way toward the butt when a violent burst of sound struck my ears. At the same moment I saw, to the right of the hut, a light puff of white smoke. Utterly astounded, I looked around at my companions. The Feldwebel had flung himself down on the ground like a goalie onto a ball and was loading his automatic. The fellow with the freckles was staggering toward me with enormous eyes and a curious, stupefied expression. When he was about six feet from me, he fell to his knees. His mouth opened as if he wanted to shout, but no sound came, and he toppled over backward. A second barrage of sound ripped the air, followed by a modulated whistle. Without thinking, I threw myself flat on the snow. The Feldwebel's automatic crackled, and I saw some snow from the roof of the butt shoot up into the air. I couldn't take my eyes off the freckled young soldier, whose motionless body lay a few yards away. Cover me, you idiots! the Feldwebel shouted as he jumped up and ran forward. I looked at the freckled soldier's friend. He seemed more surprised than frightened. Calmly we aimed our weapons toward the woods, from which a few shots still rang out and began to fire. The detonation of my Mauser restored some of my confidence, but I was still very scared. Two more bullets whistled in my ears. Our sergeant, with appalling self-assurance, stood up and threw a grenade. The air rang with the noise of the explosion, and one of the worm-eaten planks of the butt disintegrated. With incomprehensible calm, I continued to stare at the cabin. The Feldwebel's automatic was still firing. Without panic, I slid another bullet into the barrel of my gun. As I was about to shoot, two black figures ran from the ruins of the hut and headed toward the forest. It was a perfect opportunity. My gun sight stood out clearly in black against the white of the countryside and then merged into the darkness of one of the galloping figures. I pressed the trigger and missed. Our chief had run as far as the hut, firing after the fleeing men without hitting them. After a moment, he signalled us to join him, and we extricated ourselves from our holes in the snow. The Feldwebel was staring at something in the ruins of the cabin. As we drew closer, we could see a man leaning against the wall. His face, half covered by a wild, shaggy beard, was turned toward us. His eyes looked damp. He gazed at us without a word. His clothes of skin and fur were not a military uniform. My eye was caught by his left hand. It was soaked with blood. More blood was running from his collar. I felt a twinge of unease for him. The Feldwebel's voice brought me back to reality. Partisan, he shouted. Hein, you know what you're going to get. He pointed his gun at the Russian, who seemed frightened and rolled farther back into the corner. I too recoiled, but our non-com was already putting his automatic back in its holster. You take care of him, he ordered, waving toward the wounded man. We carried the partisan outside. He groaned and said something unintelligible. The sound of an approaching train was growing steadily louder. This one, however, was returning to the rear. We managed to stop it. Three soldiers wrapped in heavy reindeer skin coats jumped from the first carriage. One of them was a lieutenant, and we snapped to attention. What in God's name do you think you're doing? He barked. Why did you stop us? Our non-com explained that we were looking for labour. This train is carrying only the wounded and dying, the lieutenant said. If we had some troops on leave, I'd help you out. As it is, I can't do anything for you. We've got two wounded men, the sergeant ventured. The lieutenant was already walking over to the freckled soldier, who was lying motionless where he had fallen. You can see that this one's dead. No, mein Leutnant, he's still breathing. Ah, well, maybe, but another fifteen minutes, he gestured vaguely. Well, all right, we'll take him. He whistled at two skeletal stretcher bearers who lifted our young comrade. I thought I could see a brown stain in the middle of his back but I wasn't sure whether it was blood mixed with the green of his coat or something else. And the other one? The lieutenant asked impatiently. Over there, beside the hut. The lieutenant looked at the bearded man who was clearly dying. Who's this? A Russian, mein Leutnant, a partisan. So that's it. Do you really think I'm going to saddle myself with one of those bastards who'll shoot you in the back any time, as if war at the front wasn't enough? 
He shouted an order to the two soldiers who were with him. They walked over to the unfortunate man lying on the snow, and two shots rang out. A short time later, we were making our way back to the road. Our non-com had abandoned the idea of an improvised labour force, and we would now rejoin our unit, which undoubtedly had not made much progress. I had just been under fire for the first time, an experience I can no longer describe with any precision. An element of the absurd was mixed into the day's events. The Feldwebel's footsteps in the snow were so enormous, and I, in my confusion, kept looking for the young, freckled soldier who should have been returning with us. Everything had happened so quickly that I hadn't been able to grasp the significance of anything. Nevertheless, two human beings had suffered senseless deaths. Ours had not yet celebrated his 18th birthday. It had already been dark for some time when we finally found our company. The night was clear and cold, and the thermometer was dropping with horrifying speed. Despite our forced march of nearly four hours, we were shaking with cold and famished. My head was swimming with exhaustion, and frost from my breath lay on the high collar which I had pulled up almost to my eyes. For some time before we reached it, we were able to see our convoy, standing out clearly, black against white. Its progress had indeed been small. The trucks had sunk in through the icy white crust over the tops of their wheels, and great slabs of snow clung to their tyres and mudguards. Almost everyone had taken refuge inside the cabs. After chewing on their meagre rations, they had wrapped themselves in everything they could find and were trying to sleep despite the bitter cold. A short distance away, the two fellows who'd been chosen for guard duty were stamping on their boots, hoping to warm their feet. Inside the cabs, through the frosted glass, I could see an occasional gleam from someone's cigarette or pipe. I climbed into my truck and felt in the darkness for my rucksack and mess tin. When the tin was propped between my icy fingers, I wolfed down a few mouthfuls of some filthy mixture that tasted like frozen soya. It was so bad that I tipped most of it onto the snow and ate something else. Outside, I could hear somebody talking. I craned my neck to see who it was. A small fire had just been kindled in a hole in the snow and was burning with a cheerful brilliance. I jumped down from the truck and hurried as fast as I could toward this source of light, heat and joy. Three men were standing beside the fire, among them my Feldwebel of this afternoon. He was breaking pieces of wood across his knee. I've had enough of this cold. I had pneumonia last winter, and if I get it again, it's goodbye to me. Anyway, our trucks are visible for at least two miles, so we're not giving anything away by just lighting a few sticks. You're right, replied a fellow who must have been at least forty-five. The Russians, partisans or not, are all snug in their beds. I certainly would be glad to be home in my bed, said another, staring into the flames. We were all practically in the fire except for the big Feldwebel, who was busily reducing a packing case to fragments. Suddenly someone shouted at us. Hey, you over there! A figure was approaching us between the trucks. We could see the silver trim on his cap gleaming through the darkness. Already the Feldwebel and the old man were trampling on the fire. The captain came up to us and we stood at attention. What do you think you're doing? You must have lost your minds. Don't you know the orders? Since you've come out to watch round the campfire, you can pick up your guns and make a nice patrol of the neighbourhood. Your festivities have undoubtedly attracted a few guests. Now it's up to you to find them. By twos until we leave. Understood? It was the last straw. With death in my soul, I went off to look for my damned gun. I was on the point of collapse from hunger, exhaustion, cold and God knows what else. I would certainly never have the strength to spend the night slogging through that horrible snow, whose frozen crust covered more than two feet of white power, into which I sank over the tops of my boots. I was filled with rage which I couldn't express. Exhaustion prevented reaction. I returned to my companions in misfortune as best I could. The Feldwebel decided that the fellow who was pushing fifty, and myself, should take the first patrol. We'll relieve you in two hours, which will be easier for you. I have never understood why, but I had the distinct impression that the miserable cur had purposely put me with the old man. No doubt he preferred the other fellow as a companion twenty-five years old and strongly built to a scrawny seventeen or an old man. I started off with my fellow sufferer, convinced that we were a vulnerable combination.
After the first few steps, I tripped and fell down full length onto the snow, scraping my hands against the hard, icy crust. As I was pulling myself up, I was scarcely able to contain a paroxysm of tears. The old man was a decent sort. He, too, seemed to have had about enough. Did you hurt yourself? he asked in a paternal tone. Merde, I replied. He said nothing. Pulling his collar a little higher against his head, he let me get in front of him. I didn't really know where we were supposed to be going, but that was unimportant. What I knew beyond a doubt was that I would double back as soon as the black mass of the convoy was out of sight, and despite my exhaustion, I managed to put a considerable distance between myself and the old man. I moved forward nervously, breathing as little as possible, as the icy air burned my nose. But after a moment I couldn't go on. My knees trembled, and I dissolved in tears. I could no longer grasp anything that was happening to me. I could see clearly in my mind's eye France and my family and the games I used to play with my friends and my Meccano set. What was I doing here? I can remember crying out between bursts of sobs. I'm too young to be a soldier. I don't know whether or not my companion was surprised by my confusion. When he caught up with me, he contented himself with saying, You walk too quickly, young fellow. You must forgive me if I can't keep up with you. I shouldn't even be a soldier. I was retired before the war. But six months ago they called me up anyway. They need everyone they can get, you know. Anyway, let's hope we get home again safely. As I didn't understand very much about the times and needed someone to blame, I began to attack the Russians. And all of this on account of those bastards. The first one I meet has had it. However, I wasn't able to forget the events of the afternoon. The partisan and his execution had overwhelmed me. The poor old man looked at me in bewilderment. He must have wondered whether he was involved with a party fanatic or a security agent. Yes, he said in a carefully veiled tone. They're certainly making us sweat. It would be better to let them settle it among themselves. They won't stay Bolshevik for long. And in the end, anyway, it's none of our business. And Stalingrad, we certainly have to supply the Sixth Army. My uncle is there. They must be having a tough time. Of course they're having a tough time. We don't know everything. Finishing off Zhukov isn't going to be easy. Zhukov will quit, the way he did at Kharkov and Zhitomir. This won't be the first time General von Paulus made him run. He said nothing. As we lived without much information from the advanced front, the conversation came to a halt. I certainly never guessed that the doom of Stalingrad was already sealed that the soldiers of the Sixth Army had given up hope and were fighting in horrible conditions, with heroic tenacity, 